See, the blessings he gave me was overcoming blessings, so I know the devil can't use them. Man, that poor devil, he just catches all kind of stuff. Man, the devil trying to still can't quit talking that crazy talk. One thing what God gave you can't nobody take from you, but you can give it away. But you'll never have to worry about the devil taking. He don't want the peace that God gave you. That's when he lives in chaos. What could he do with the peace that God gave you? Hmm? That drive him crazy. And here you are letting him make you think he's taking something from you. He ain't taking nothing from me. Because the first thing he got to take from me is the blood that bought me. And guess what he can't do? He can't mess with that. So all you that's living in fear of whatever, I just thank God for being God to me. I'm not trying to worship somebody else's God. I'm not even trying to be like anybody else. You know why? Because when God called me, he knew what he had in store for me. I finally had to settle into that because, see, I'm the kind of guy that believes in giving a lot of instruction. And I used to try to tell God some things because I thought he didn't understand. He, I thought he'd never met nobody like me. <laughs> and I'm sure all y'all are guilty of pointing out things to God that he needs to take care of, right? Ain't you? Have you been busy? Lord, you know what you need to do. Now, why would you even think that he didn't know? He was already doing what you thought he needed to do. I had a dream last night. Matter of fact, I was dreaming. Friday night, I think I was having a dream. And I was running all night in my dream. Somebody had, was chasing me, a sniper. Everywhere I went, he went. But then the night, last night, I had another dream. It wasn't about no sniper, though. It was about my Savior. You know, certain things happen to us over the time. We don't really realize. Uh, I think the older I get, the more I appreciate life. It becomes more special to me. Every day I wake up, see, I, I just believe that every day I get up now is added bonuses. Because I figured around 35, I'd be already dead. Then he messed around and let me keep living. And you go through that one part in life, I got about 60. Then my mortality showed up and I got afraid, get to thinking, man, I may wake up dead in the morning. I know y'all laughing. I'm just telling you how things happen in your head. And I'll be in there thinking about, man, what somebody come in and find me dead all by myself? I ain't gonna talk about that God. Y'all done went down on me. I gotta bring it back up. Everybody wants to live, but you ain't. We'll start living until you recognize that there is another part of this that has to happen. And no matter what I think about it, and no matter how much I love here, which I'll be honest with you, I'm loving Jesus a lot more now than I did before. Because if there is no God, we are in trouble. I'm just telling you that now. I ain't trying to tell nobody what to believe or how to believe, but I'm telling you right now, if there ain't no God, you are definitely in trouble. Because I don't see no answers coming from nowhere but from Him. And if you knew what I knew, then you would definitely be seeking Him for answers and no one else. Because one thing I find out about God, His answers are always true. And they always can be trustworthy. You can trust in what God speaks at any time. And we live in a moment now where I really feel I'm not a prophet of doom or nothing, but I just, I, I'm not prophesying doom, but some people, victory is going to be doomed for others. Some people haven't got the memo yet. 
Jesus told us a long time ago, but we didn't believe what he said. He said, I'm going to be with you always. Somehow now we let somebody preach Jesus away from us. Somehow we put Jesus inside of a box, put him inside of a building. We meet him once a week, maybe two. And not realizing that he knew there were seven days in a week he worked in all seven except for the last one. And so I feel that sometimes we forget what salvation is about. It's not just about you putting your name on a church roll. It's not just about you belonging to some group. But real Christianity, which I hate to call it Christianity, because basically what we've done, we made Christianity a religion and not a relationship. Nothing can change our world until we first understand why God has us here. And there's two things he gave us to do while we're here. And if you think God is going to sidestep or forget what he said he wants, two things you got to do. And all of them has to do with relationships. And we as Christian people have, are the worst kind for relationships. I'm just saying. We, we are the worst kind when it comes to relationship because we get a certain independence and such a liberation and freedom that we really feel free from each other, but really we all in it together. The Bible says we all baptize into one body by one spirit. He doesn't have a spirit for the Baptist. He doesn't have a spirit for the Catholic. He doesn't have a spirit for the Presbyterian. He has one spirit in which we're all baptized into one body. But we can't glean from that because we really feel like, you know, I hear people say, boy, you know, they, they ain't as quite as saved. They almost saved. There is no such thing. You, you, you're not almost saved. You're either Saved or lost. Then you got Christian people talking about, boy, I hope I'll be saved in the end. Well, if you ain't saved right now, you probably won't be. I don't want to wait to die to figure out if I am when I know that I can be right now. God doesn't have them time to release salvation like we think he does. The Bible says when he saved you, he saved you to the other most. There is no lacking in his salvation. But I'm not going to even get into that. Let's, I know you got some roast cooking. I'm being real spiritual. I'm fasting this morning. My daughter and son-in-law, glad to see y'all. Since was, I know you, what, I, I, Sister Vanessa, she reminded me that she was baptized over here. I could see when you get old, when you get old, you it's not a stuff that's kind of lay kind of dead in the basement of your mind. If I don't see people enough, I, I'll forget real quick. I ain't gonna lie to you. Now I'm having that problem. I told I'm taking jellyfish supplements. <laughs> they said, because that stuff really works on your mind. Have your mind be sharp. I'm trying to keep my mind sharp. Just in case this is a book number, let me get a job at DMH and I can go ahead and work on some surgery out there. Well, I, they practicing, ain't they? Is they practicing medicine? I want to practice with them. Ain't that something? I asked somebody one time, I said, would you go to a witch doctor? They said, no. Would you? I cornered him now. I said, would you go to a witch doctor to get diagnosed? Well, y'all what? Either yes or no? You scared? Wait a minute. And all you got to do is go home, look in the dictionary. 
and you're not going to believe what they call a witch doctor. They come on the same heading as a doctor. They call them practitioners. Because they're practicing. Not perfected. That's why whenever they fill out their medical manuals, they always say their fatalities because they're practicing. Some of them ain't going to make it. How many of you know that Jesus has a perfect school in medicine? He don't practice. Uh -uh. I said Jesus don't even practice medicine. He even told you, you know what he said? Now it's bad when you start bragging yourself, but I believe when Jesus brag, he can back it up. And he called himself the great, the great what? Now that takes a whole lot to call yourself that if you lose in cases. But he is willing to step up and say, you know what? I am the great physician. Because I didn't come to earth to practice medicine. I came to give healing. That's not my message. Come on, stand with me. Psalm 27. I better quit before I get off. It's just so good to be alive. And I know all y'all so thankful. I know y'all had a great day of Thanksgiving. I know that you did invoke some Thanksgiving while you was eating turkey or something. I hope you did. But I hope to God that you didn't just quit Thursday and start and, and then start Friday again. Because the real truth of the matter is that we need to practice Thanksgiving every day. If you want to release God in your life, you want God to be free to motor, to operate in your life, the first thing you must become is thankful. Well, I can't thank God for this. That's why you ain't got nothing. I, I'm going to say this and I'm going to say it again. And people, you hair lifts the devil, they get mad. The Bible said we ought to give thanks in some of y'all choking on that all, ain't you? How many of y'all have practiced it? Don't 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 say. Have we practiced giving thanks in all things, or have we found a chance or a moment when we want to complain about everything? You understand, God, God doesn't change his mind because you changed yours. And that thing will keep coming to you until you finally start saying, thank you, Jesus. Well, you mean to tell me I've got to give God thanks for this? If he said so, guess what? The key, the answer to, and solution to your unthankfulness is becoming thankful. It's so easy to get out of the step. Psalm 27, verse 4. I'm going to go ahead and preach a little bit. I, I just thank God every day now. Lord have mercy. He's so good to me. He's so good to me. I don't know about anybody else. I'm not sure you got time to stop by your place at all. But I will tell you this. Every day is a great day in God. I appreciate everything he does. I know someone said, well, boy, man, what you got? I got everything God gave me. When I leave, I'm going to take it with me. There's a lot of stuff I got on my own. I'm going to leave it behind. But everything God gave me, Brother Pope, is going out of here with me. And he told me, I've given you all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. All those things are staying with me. And that's the most important thing. We have got to reprioritize our life. What really matters? We've given too much time to stuff that really don't matter. I've watched too many people die. I've watched us store up junk after junk after junk to the ceiling. And wake up one day and they're gone and it's, the junk is still there. 
God ain't interested in your junk. He said, I want to give you something to cause that man in you, that new man in you to grow every day. Those are blessings we need to be looking for. The psalmist said, one thing have I desired of the Lord. And that will also get First of all, we don't have people with one desire. If we can have just get single in our desires, if we could ever get desire down to just one answer, just A, not B, and C. What could you live without in this world? What, what do you think you could live without? I can live without everything in this world, but I can't live without Jesus. I'm not just sinning because I'm in church. I've come to realize that I'm when I leave here, I got to be with him. I might as well stay with him while I'm here. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I take out, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. Now that's David's concept. Going to the house of God. Finding peace. Seem like sometimes you find those places where you just shut down everything, all the noise is gone, and all you can do is hone in on Jesus. But see, David had to go to a place. He had to be literally walk to a place to find that. And here we are today. Know ye not. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. In other words, David had to leave and go somewhere, but you ain't got to go not one spot. Right where you sit now. Right where you are at this moment. You can have all of God's beauty. You can have all of God's goodness right in your temple right now. Right where you are right now. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me. How many of you know the Bible says your life is hid? Where? Sometimes I wonder how the devil finds you so easy. If my life is hid in Christ, how are you being picked on so much? How does he seem to find you all the time? And I hope to God that we have not left the city of refuge to be attacked by. Because I believe if I'm in Christ, any attacks that come while I'm in Christ, there's no doubt about that one. It's called victory. He shall set me upon a rock. Precious God, I thank you. And Lord, I pray as we gather our minds and hearts to hear it together. Lord, impart truth revelation, faith. Lord, I pray today that we might be totally encouraged in our faith towards you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Don't you just admire people that have them great testimonies. Don't you admire people because I used to sit down them older saints a long time ago. Man, they had me so excited. They had me ready to quit my job. No sooner I got saved. And now I realized I had a car payment, so I was stayed on the job. It changed my mind. For a minute that though, I was, it, 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 you know, because I was hearing them people talking about how they'd be riding across the desert with no gas, and somehow the car just kept going. I let mine get down on the edge, started sputtering, and I said, well, no. But I enjoy hearing the testimonies of people. And I, I think sometimes we, it, we get overly excited because a lot of times we hear the testimonies but we didn't hear the whole story that brought them to it. We hear what happened to them and, you know, we just catch the last part. They made it. Most of the time they never tell you all the things that led up to that testimony. 
Most of the time we're interested in conclusion of the matter. We're not overly concerned about, it's almost like the prodigal son, you know. Him coming home looking all nasty and dirty. He probably went to church and told them about how he came back and they just look at him how nice he's dressed now. But they didn't hear the whole story about the hog pens and all that kind of stuff. Because, see, God got this process. He, he seemed to have this process that brings us to different places in him that cause us to think differently. And every promise, and I know all of you believe in the promises of God, right? You, you believe he promised you certain things, right? And you expect certain things. It's like God, he promises things. But he never usually tell you how it can be obtained. He'll give you those promises that uh, I'm going to give you land flow and making honey, but he didn't tell you that there was a fight all the way. He, he didn't explain to you. See, because he even says in Hebrews said, if those people that were walking by faith would have been mindful of where they were going, they would have stayed where they were. That's Kelly Wilson translation. They were never left. They didn't know when God told them to step out, go to the promised land. They didn't know they were going to go through all of that to get it. They were expecting to step off into the promised land, no hindrances, no sidestepping, God promised us. That's why many of them, when they left their false promised land, they prayed that God would send them back. Because they live, yeah, we're not careful, we create our own false promised land. We'll make our world so good that his promised land don't look as good. We can get so much that what God has given don't seem like nothing. Be almost like Esau. When Jacob got the blessing and Jacob came back and wanted to share it with his brother, his brother told him, it's okay. I got enough. He had enough of everything, but he didn't have enough of God. And so the Lord constantly brings us into these modes of difficulty. I see more people crying out saying, I'm in need of prayer. Could you tell me why you ain't praying? If you feel you in need of prayer, are you praying? You will never find anybody's prayer more powerful than your own. And the reason I'm telling you that because it works according to the power that works in you. God is not going to sidestep your unfaith, your non-faith to give you faith because somebody wanted you to have it. It's what you desire, he says. It's what do you desire. You come to God. I don't want, I know my kids used to be guilty of it. They had a designated spokesman. Rachel, go ask Dad. God don't want no stepkids. God wants each individual to know that he is their daddy. And that you, he pointed to us and said, me? See, I can go to daddy. Come on, I said, I can go to daddy. 
I don't need the only one to come with me. I can go to daddy on my own. Oh, praise God. Here we go. It's going to be a long day. So we have to be recognized the truth essence of God in our everyday life. Someone told us that, you know, he told me when I got saved, everything going to be all right. And that was a lie. That's very confusing to me. Brother Evans, I never had the worst time in my life was when I got saved. I'm doing good lost. I mean, well. <laughs> At least I knew I was lost. But then when I got saved, so I just want to be, I, I just want to be just, hey, no, not all that. I don't need all of that other stuff. God, just, just, just save me. Just don't bring in all that other stuff. Man, I got to say, my God, my world turned upside down. Yeah. I couldn't get my head on straight because they kept telling me how everything going to be all right. And everything in my life a whole year was not all right. Hallelujah. They should have told me that God was going to process me. But we have to recognize that we're in God's hand. God is concerned about every facet of your life. He is more concerned than anybody you could ever think of. I know we as human beings have a, the ability to show concern, but not like God. Because our concern don't last as long as God. God had you on his mind and in his heart before the other people ever showed up. You never look at trials. You never look at things. You know, everybody like compare everything, you know. Well, how come they ain't going through something? I don't care how come they're not. What I'm concerned about is what God is bringing me through because it's important to me to know the God that's bringing me through it. I'm not trying to compare my troubles. I'm not comparing nothing. It's not even why. Don't ever ask God, why do I have to go through this? If he thought you didn't have to, you wouldn't. Oh, praise God. We act as though something strange has happened to us. We act as though somehow God is treating us unfavorable because we have some troubles. Not so. Lord can send you through the same thing and never give you the same outcome. You know why we get messed up? Because we'll see somebody else get blessed. And we won't. You will ask them, what did you do? They'll tell us. And you know what we'll do? We'll try to copy what they done. And then don't get what they got. Then that kills their faith because they're wondering, well, I've done the same thing they done. And God didn't do it for me. Because that wasn't for you. What the song say? What God has for me, it is for me. You don't want anything somebody else has when God got you because he knows exactly, exactly what you have need of even before you even ask. Oh, God, help me. So there are people that have lost faith in God. Because they were expecting God to work in their life like he did in somebody else's. There are people that have more confidence in other people's faith than they do in the faith they should have themselves in God. You see, I know, I know we, we get those songs and man, we have, we have uh, 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 preached the gospel in our songs, I guess, the gospel songs, I guess, what they call it gospel music but a lot of we don't believe half of what we sing and you know that one we like victory victory shall be mine victory shall be mine if I
He suddenly had enough jumping off the walls. Do you know how many people can hold it? <laughs> we could say that something about that night, though. We'll, if I hold my peace and let the Lord hold it. But then church service over. Where are we at? Are we holding our peace? No. I got, I got to get this off my mind. I got to tell them something. If I hold my peace, let the Lord fight what? You know, bro, it's, it's, I'm not laughing. It looks like I am, but I'm not. But did you hear what that song just said? Now, how many? Don't just look this way. This is rhetorical. You ain't got to say nothing. Now, how many of y'all been in trouble lately and just held your peace? Didn't say nothing. I should look at everybody's bottom left because usually they don't bit through it. If they're holding their peace, their lips are busted. They bit their lips because they couldn't talk. I already know it's just a song. But you know what happened? We have learned how to take our troubles and put songs behind them that we don't even believe. This was given to the Israelites. If you hold your peace, I'll fight them for you. They, they give them to the Israelites coming out of Egypt. Sometimes we love to drag these songs into our song books and we sing them without knowing that, again, every time God does something, he don't do it the same way. He told them this one time. He told them over in the land of promise, he said, the battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. I heard one time he said, they haven't done it to you, but they did it to me. How many of y'all believe that? Well, Jesus, if they done it to you, why does it hurt me so bad? You said he ain't doing it to me. Well, how come I'm feeling it? You ever felt like that? Right? And then, then you come talk to a person like me and I say, well, you know what the Bible said? He ain't doing it to you. He ain't. Then you're going to look for somebody that say you something different. Because you want somebody to tell you, poor child, yeah, let's hold hand and pray about it. Because we're we going to pray this thing away. Let me tell you something about a test. You've heard it before. I'm going to tell you one more time. If God has you in a test, I don't care how many people pray with you about it. It will not overrule it. Because if God got you in a test, you got to believe this. He got you there for a reason. And you know why? They can't pray it away. Because it's through those tests that God is building an inner man, new man in you of faith. I know sometimes life is not always good, as we call it. But can't nobody take away what God is putting you through. I pray for your comfort. I pray that God give you more grace. But I tell you what we can't, we got to make sure the thing we're praying against is not praying against God. That's what Paul got in trouble with. He was fighting against God. Jesus said, Paul, Saul, Saul, why 
do you persecute me? Because every time he touched a saint, it was like touching Jesus. You need to realize that even though you may feel the pain, you ain't felt all the pain. Because he bore all of your pain. That little bit you going through, you saying you can't hardly make it, I promise you. It, ain't compa it cannot compare to the pain that he bore for you. Oh, hallelujah. And so the, the, the attitude sometimes in our salvation journey and when God's bringing us through stuff and sometimes we get all upset because it seems like every time we look around we're going through something you know everybody well I'm going through I know we are that's good because after a while we're going to be people that have so much faith in God and that's what God looking for my spirit is still looking for people that I can show myself strong in God is looking for people that will believe him in spite of what's going on in their life. God is still good. I don't care how bad you think the world is. God is still good. Oh, praise God. So many times is that there are things. There are times when you're not going to be to hold your peace. Uh oh, Here we go. See, sometimes we get one verse and we stay. It's a lot easier to eat that verse. But he didn't only say, hold your peace, like the Lord fights about. There was other places he said things like, uh, you know, whatsoever you desire, believe, you shall have Whatsoever thing you say, there are times when you're not going to just sit still. There are times when you're going to have mountains in which you say, if you speak to this mountain and doubt not, believe that it shall be removed. This is why you can't just live religiously and think you got the religious answer. This is why you got to be connected with Jesus so that you'll know what mountain needs to be spoken to. You need to know when to be still and know that he's God. You don't need to just move anytime you want to move, but move when God says move. When they were coming out, they had to wait until the fire went in front. Stop when the fire is behind. Just because we say we in God don't mean that we just do whatever. But there are directions in which God gives us by his spirit. That's why the Bible say they that are led. You can't be led by your emotions and think you're going to embrace God. You can't be led by your feelings and think somehow God is leading you. He's not. He said they that are led by my spirit. There are times when we have to fight the good fight of faith. I'm not sure what that all entails. I'm not sure, you know, when you say we're fighting the good fight, I'm not sure what that all entails. Uh, I know the one who wrote it. I know what he is there. I know when he talked about fighting the good fight of faith that he had quite a fight. I can't say I had that kind yet. And then sometimes I think it's probably easier to fight natural things than it is to fight spiritual things. <laughs> it's easy to fight the enemy that you know. That's the reason why the terrorist groups are so powerful is because they don't wear uniforms. And you don't know which one is which. If you can recognize your enemy, then it's easier to fight the enemy. But what's bad is when you got enemies that you can't identify. I told y'all before, I used to suffer from depression so bad. I used to be so depressed, man. I prayed that God would just go ahead and take my life. I rolled down to the dam one time and told him, hey, please, let, let's just get on out of here. 
You know what I'm saying? Ain't no sense of sticking around here. This gonna take me on out. I'm down here where the water's running, it's serene. Well, I'm just being honest with you. I suffered from depression. And you know what depression is? It's an invisible enemy you can't see. You don't even know where it's coming from. I would get up Monday morning and I'd be so messed up. I didn't even feel slave. Well, I got quiet. Well, the Wilson, you mean? God knew exactly where I was. And he knew exactly, even though I was talking stupid, he knew better. Because to be honest with you, there's nothing. I don't know if anything more dark than depression. Because there's no light, there's no way out. There's no doors, there's nothing. It's like your mind done caved in. It's like your whole head is in darkness and you can't see no kind of light. And so I went through that. And of course, then I'm asking God all the time, Lord, how can I be so up? On Sunday. And when Monday come, man, I, I'm so far down. If, I, if we had a high service on Sunday, that means I'm going to have a low day on Monday. I started looking around my house because, I, you know, if you're broke, I can understand you're being depressed. If you ain't got no food in the refrigerator, I can see some depression coming in. Can't pay your bills, but none of those things was my problem. I got up every day and I looked in. The, I went in my kitchen, checked out everything. Everything was good. My kids were doing good, pretty good at that time. You know what I found out? You see, we have an adversary that loves you to focus on, on problems that are not even there. You know what I found out how to treat depression? See, there are things in this Bible that kind of points it out. The spirit of heaviness. Remember it talks about that in the Bible? For the spirit of heaviness, that's the spirit of depression. I'm going to give you the garment of you, you know what most people haven't done yet? You can embrace depression if you want to. But God gave us the garment of praise to get rid of heaviness. See, I believe that, you know, we talked about we're going to lift him up, lift him up. You can't lift Jesus no higher than you are because he's in you. So when I go to praise God, that's when I say, we've got to quit praising God to, to get entertained. you got to praise God with purpose. If I'm in depression, I'm not just praising God, just throwing up words, but I want to make sure I'm praising him with a purpose of this depression that I'm going through so I can cast off that garment, that heavy garment. I want the praise of God to be lifted up in this temple right here. Oh, hallelujah. You see, sometimes, I know how it is, people are embarrassed to have a problem, but why? Every human being has Last I read in the book, you know what he said? They all came short. <laughs> you know what it tells me? No matter how good I thought I was or how good you is, you still got some problems. God is still bringing you through some problems. And he's going to continue to do that till he begin to see his image in you. God is not concerned about where you shopped and bought your clothes at. But he is concerned about the image that he sees coming from you. He wants to be able to look at you and see himself. He wants you to be like him. As I am, so are you in this world. And unless you've seen Jesus complaining, we don't have no reason to. I saw him take a beating, kept his mouth shut. What a 
the good Jesus we got. Good thing he chose him and not me. I want to be taking no more whoopings. Matter of fact, you may have slapped me one time, but I bet you one thing, your feet would have been hot. We would have had french fries that day. Crispy critters. I'm just being honest. Of course, of course, I know he would have to change me in order for me to do that. I know if he just took me off the street and said, I want you to go to Calvary for the people. And I got, you got all this power. Then y'all step up and start spitting on me like that. <laughs> Somebody gonna want some oxygen. Somebody gonna be trying to get some oxygen. Cause I'm gonna turn that spigot off. I'm gonna watch your eyes get real big. And if you don't hear them apologize, you're gonna hear them apologize to me, ain't you? Say you're sorry. Uh -oh. Anyway, let me keep going. But there are times, you know how we sit down? Because we don't want nobody to know we need Jesus. We, we don't want nobody to know that. We, we know we're here and we want God to kind of like read our mind. Lord, you know I came. Service almost over. He ain't showed up yet. He done went up and down every aisle, but seemed to be yours. Everybody done shouted, failed the spirit, and you still sitting there knowing you have need. And you know how we conduct service. Do not get disorderly. Do not break from the ranks. You know. Don't haul on Jesus when the preacher's preaching. You can call him a little bit in the song, sir, because we'll think you're singing with us. But other than that, you can't disrupt the service. And a lot of people sit in church knowing that Jesus was there. And so, knowing that he was walking down there. But they, and you know how people tell you, you know, when we invite you to church, we kind of tell you, look, we you just educate you. I know back in the day, man, we always tell them because we're kind of wild. We kind of get you kind of, now when you come now, you know they're going to be kind of boisterous. You're going to be doing some things, you know, you may not be used to, but they stay real close to you because they're scared of death. I know I was. I had never seen nobody doing all that stuff when I first walked into the Pentecostal church. Can you imagine? Man, I wouldn't even look back. I was so scared. I could hear them back there, but I wasn't looking back. And then the ones beside me was acting up. I'm trying to figure out, am I supposed to raise my hand? So what I done, I got them halfway up. You know, I, I want... I didn't get them up like they did. I won't do like that. I'm going to get half surrendered. But here was this blind Bartimaeus. Can you imagine if he would have done what the crowd was doing? You know, they were saying to him, be quiet. Be quiet. You're going to disrupt the service. But he had a need. Why are the people that really have needs, where are the people that really refuse to sit still? Where are the people who say, I'm no longer going to sit like this forever? They said, don't shh, be quiet. He said, Jesus. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they kept saying, be quiet, be quiet. Friend, there comes a time when you need to be quiet, but there are other times when you need to open your mouth. 
And you need to begin to tell God, I, 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 I can't, you can't get answers from nowhere else. You need to talk to Jesus. You need to call on him and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. You, you know what last night my dream was about? The very thing. The very thing. God was dealing with me in my sleep saying, you know what? Most people will come to an altar, but they won't come to the mercy seat. The Bible said, when you have need, you're supposed to boldly come before the throne of grace and mercy. We got people going, they visit altars every Sunday, but they won't go to the mercy seat where the needs can be met. There are times, the Bible says in Hosea, when you come to God, take with you words. We've got people, got special unspoken. <laughs> take with you words. Take with you the matter. Don't go to God talking about Lord, I'm praying a special unspoken. When you got special unspoken that you can't speak to God, that's too special. Hmm? If it's that special, don't tell nobody. I got a special unspoken. What do you mean a special unspoken? When you come to God, it said, take words. Take the matter that concerns you, take it to God. If you know what's wrong with you, take it to God. Well, God knows what I'm going through. No, he, well, yeah, he do. Yeah, I take it that he do. He know what I'm going through, he sure do. But do you know what you're going through? Huh? Because sometimes God want to hear you say something. Every now and then he wants you to talk to him a little bit. And I don't know a better time to talk to him when I, uh, 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 until I'm in trouble. We got a whole lot of conversation. Now, God, now you see this here? Do, do you understand where I is right here? Let me tell you what you need to do. Of course, he ain't going to take my advice. But at least I'm telling him. When I come to God, I'm not coming out with my mouth shut. I got to bring my matter to God. Whatever that matter be. He said, turn to the Lord, send him, take away all iniquity and receive us graces so we will render the cast of our lip. See, that, can't, that sour Phoenician woman, she didn't come to God talking about, well, Lord, you know what's wrong with my daughter. No. She came straight forward, said, Jesus, I got a daughter. Matter of fact, she's a, almost said she was a devil possessed. She's messed up. Sometimes we don't even want to agree with that. But we can't come to God lying thinking we're going to get a true solution. He said my, my daughter is possessed with this evil spirit. Is an owner. He said Jesus, once again Jesus thou son of David have mercy. When was the last time in your life that you've asked God, seriously, Lord, have mercy? Do you know it works when nothing else does? Do you realize that his mercy is unto all generation? His mercy was at the tree of life in the garden. But they chose to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Most people want to know how good they can become without coming to God and finding it takes the mercy of God to perfect you. It takes his mercy to really forgive you. It, his mercy is given to all creatures. That's why I know people that don't even serve God but called on the mercy of God and got healed. This South Phoenician woman wasn't even a part of the covenant of the Jews. But her daughter got delivered. What would happen then if you are the people of God 
that you know he is a God of mercy and you can't even call on him? Oh, hallelujah. She said, my daughter, she's been vexed with the devil. But the Bible said, the whatsoever you say, not what you're thinking now. I know you got to have good thoughts, but it's got to come out your mouth. Because really, your truth, the truth or the lie is in the tongue. There are times when you need to get up, start to prophesy. See, the Bible says the Holy Ghost in you is a spirit of prophecy. And you need to be able to speak to things in your life. You don't need to be a preacher. You ain't got to be a bishop. The same anointing on us is on you. Well, the Bible said that, that spirit that baptizes bottles in, all our gifts work from the same spirit. There are times when God wants you to speak to a situation. You need to talk to it. You need to get the mind of God. If he says, speak, speak. When he said, whatever he tells you to do, say it. I have seen God work in so many different times in his, in his way. Told me one time, just speak to the foreign object. I said, but that's the way we pray. That wasn't the way we pray. You know how we pray? Brother Evan called me. He, I'm sick. Oh, let me slap off. I don't know what's wrong with him. Because they had my brother, he had them gallstones, kidney stones. And I was going, I had my little bottle of oil. I can get ready to grease him up. I'm going to slap oil all on him. Sometimes I feel like if you put more oil on him, they'll be more slick. But I was kind of like upset in the Holy Ghost. See, I don't like riding dead horses. I do not like right. If I keep doing something that ain't working and it's supposed to work, I have to question something. Now, I, I know how they told me it's supposed to work. But see, I didn't know. I thought that God operated just because I said it. But God, I, I rode around that day. I said, Lord, and back then it seemed like everybody's getting sick. And, and he said, I said, God, I refuse to go up here and pray for my brother till I hear from you. I rode around out there on DMH lot, Decatur Mental Health. I mean, Decatur Memorial Hospital. But it used to be Decatur Mental Health. Then they changed it to a hospital. I rode around that lot. I said, God, I'm not going up here and laying no hands on nobody and putting no all on nobody until I hear from you. Now, y'all may think I'm joking. It don't even really matter to me. But that day, the Lord said, I want you to go and speak to the thing and tell it come out. You know what I did, Brother Evan? I went out there. Before I got ready to leave, I said, Brother, I'm going to pray. Y you know, preachers love to feel some kind of do dance. Hands got to sweat. You know, you, we got to go into s s real stuff. See, because it's, it's not how many times I speak in tongues over me. That doesn't make anything happen. But when you do what God tells you to do, It'll happen just like he said. I wouldn't pray for him, didn't feel nothing. I'm talking, if faith was a feeling, I was on zero. All I'd done was what God told me to do. You know what happened? You ain't gonna believe it. I don't think nobody in the room spoke in time. I spoke to the thing until it come out. And I left. The next morning, because he's going into surgery right after I was leaving. But the next morning, he came knocking on my door saying, man, you ain't going to believe this. And I'm, I'm, I forgot I even prayed for him in the hospital. 
He said, when you left, those stones came out. What am I telling you? That's just one. I, that's others, but I'm telling you now. If God is speaking to you, he's not going to deviate from what he told you. I see another time when people came in, told me what God told them, told me what God told me to do in the situation. They changed the situation, guess what? Nothing happened. God is not asking you to fix it. God is the fixer. All he's asking for is you to hear his voice. Know what he's saying to you. Because you're going to look at somebody else think you should do it like them, but he's not in you like that. He wants you to be special in him. Oh, hallelujah. You see, I, I'm getting ready to close in just a second. There are dilemmas, things in our life. Never be afraid to pray, first and foremost. Never be afraid to listen to God. Never be afraid to get down and close all the noise down and hear what God has to say about the situation. Because you'll go crazy trying to figure it out because your brains are not big enough to figure out your problem. If you could, you wouldn't need Jesus. Many times we wrestle with our minds. We wrestle, you know, doubts and fears. And I know everybody has them. We're afraid when we don't need to be afraid. And we have doubts in our minds. We got fears. Fear, all kinds of fear. What happened is this? What if I do this? What's going to happen to me now? No, there's, those things are unwarranted. That comes a plan, time in our life when we must understand we are in God's hand. And can't nobody pluck you out. You got to realize that all power is in his hand. And as long as you stay in his hand, you can enjoy all of his power. You see, uh, here is David. Let me, let me just try to quit. Everybody want to have some semblance of faith that doesn't grow. Not knowing that, you know, I'm looking at this story. A lot of times we look at stories, we just, you know, they don't make movies out of half of them and, and traumatized and got us all messed up. You know, God must have a lot of confidence in you. Like David. Can, can you imagine God being who he is, knowing that there's lions and bears out here. It, it almost seemed like he always puts you in harm's way. Now here is a young man. He's a man after God's own heart. And God got this boy. I know you're saying his daddy put him out there. But you know, I think God had a lot to do with that. You know what I found about God? I, I heard a lot of people say, boy, I need to get in the will of God. Most of the time you are, you just don't even know it. What it is is that he's not doing your will. But he, you ain't got to worry about him doing his will. Here's somebody said, well, you know, I pray, nevertheless, thy will be done. You ain't got to worry about Jesus' will being done. I guarantee you, even when you think you ain't, he got it. Here's this boy, this young, probably about 13-year-old boy. Out here in the middle of nowhere. See, I'm, I'm used to street lights, sidewalks. Can you imagine? Well, I'll probably have set my sons out there too. Give this some nature training. Yeah, because my boys are kind of rough. I would have probably put them out there on the backside. See if they could whoop them lines and things. But all the while you would think, well, what kind of father will put their kids in harm's way? 
What kind of father would put them out here where there's lions and bears? Boy, when God started building confidence in people, you'd be amazed what happens. That day when he was killing lions and bears, oh, that wasn't nothing. Because, see, God has something bigger. See, most of us fail at the small. We thought they were big. But God has something even more potent than lions and bears. So what did God do? He brings them into a bigger test. How many of y'all crying for a bigger test? That little one is too small for you. Come on, tell the truth. You know, you don't, you don't age that little small stuff. <laughs> I've been killing bears and lions all my life. Praise God, you've been jumping in every service. You know, back in 1980, I'll kill the bear. But what you didn't know, God got some more things ahead of you that ain't lions and bears. We're being blown away because we look at it and say, boy, I don't think I can do this one. Let me tell you something. If God brought you to this, God been getting ready to expose you to something that you ain't never seen. If you thought God was great in your small trial, woo, you ought to see what he's going to do in them big ones. David said, I'll tell you what. I've been on the backside fighting lions and bears. Now I got this great big old Shaquille O'Neal kind of guy shouting obscenities about my God. The same one that was with me in the field. The same one that delivered me. The same one that saved me. I got this giant now. God is not trying to expose you to a bigger trial. You know what God is trying to do? Expose you to a bigger God. Hmm? Have you ever thought about that? How many of you think you've seen all God can do? How many of you think that you've seen God as big as He ever going to get? Come on, Stan, I'm going to let you go. I, I, too many people feel like God is outdated, God is ancient. So many people feel like God can't do what he used to do. He ain't even trying. That's so much more of God to do that he ain't got to do what he used to do. And if there was a time when we need the exposure, when we need God to expose himself bigger than he's ever exposed himself. But you know what we have done? Do I think we have limited the effectiveness of God? I just wonder before we leave today. I'm not asking you to cry like Bartimaeus or the Siphonician woman. I don't think God has a hearing problem at all. But every now and then we just need to say something. We need to say something. I don't need to hear you. God needs to hear you. Man, it would be nice if someone would just say, Lord, have mercy. I've been trying to figure some things out. I've been trying to work on some things. Lord, would you have mercy on me? I wish somebody in here right now would have enough fortitude today and just say, Lord, have mercy on me. Because what that's going to do is release some things that that you probably didn't even know was wrong, you'd be amazed at what God can do because you will dare say, Lord, have mercy on me. Oh, blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, you said your mercy endureth unto all generations. And you said that it's in this place, the throne of mercy, where justice and judgment is become the habitation of your throne this is where we get our justice 
This is where we get the judgment is favorable to us from you. Mercy and truth says shall go before his face. Blessed is the people that knows that joyful sound. I want to tell you this morning, God looks over all that's yours. There are things today that we need to remember and never forget. In such crazy times as these, I, I believe that we need to remember the people of God, your children, your children's children, all of them are blessed because of you. And you need to begin to even cry that, Lord, have mercy. Because you promised me that not only would I be blessed, not only is this promise to me, but this promise is also to my children. It's to my children's children. And I am that children, children, children. Lord, I praise you today. I thank you, dear God, for what you have shared abroad in our hearts today. Lord, thank you in advance. Thank you, Lord. Right now, in Jesus' name we pray. And all I'm going to say is this. As elementary as some of these things may seem to us, I have finally come to this conclusion. They only work when you use them. And if you tell me that God can't help you, then I guess there's no help on earth. But Lord, I pray and I thank you for your mercy today. In Jesus' name, amen.